can't help myself. So, <laughs> so round of applause for your GOP gubernatorial ticket, Jeff Johnson, Donna Bergstrom. How's the fair been so far, guys? The fair has been awesome. There is a... Uh... There's an energy out here right now that I, I was not feeling four years ago. It's night and day, and that's, it's very encouraging. I don't know if you have a different take on that. But. This fair has been phenomenal. We have been having a hard time keeping those buttons in stock, so that's the good news. Yeah, well, that's exciting. Sam has half of them, it appears. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think we've gone through eight or 9,000 buttons. We run out around 1 o'clock every day, and uh, wow. I, I mean, it's been good. It's been real good. Talk a little bit about uh, while we're here at the fair. Do you, you, do you got any favorite fair foods? What's your, uh, what's your favorite fair experience? What's, a, what's like a can't miss thing? Bacon. For Jeff and Nana. <laughs> well, for Jeff, it's, yeah. it's the bacon that's dipped in uh, maple syrup. Okay. Very nice. See, that's why you're, you're going to be a good governor. <laughs> well, I've got the sweet tooth, so I'm going to say it's Sweet Martha's Cookies. It's also a very acceptable answer. Yeah. Okay, good. We'll, 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 we'll take that. We'll allow it. We'll allow it. You, you talk about the energy and expand upon that a bit. Uh, the, you know, we've had some record-breaking, record-breaking crowds. Yep. Um, I, you know, I, I think there's a, there's a lot of different factors involved in that. Weather's been just fantastic yep. you know, uh, for, the, for, for the past week or so. But the, you know, the economy is doing great. And, and, I mean, I think we all feel a, better, right? I mean, not just the job that President Donald Trump's been doing, but a, the tangible difference in, in, all of our, in all of our bank accounts. So speak a little bit about that. How does that translate into political energy? How does that translate into the vibe of when you're out there talking with potential voters? Well, I think it's a couple things. I think that is part of it. I, there are a lot... We, we just have a constant line of people waiting to talk to one or both of us at the, at the booth, and it lasts from the start of the fair to, to we close down. And there are so many people who are coming up who are saying to me, at least, I really haven't been involved before. Or this was the first primary I ever voted in. Um, or, you know, I, I, I've, I've never helped on a campaign. How do we sign up? And I think part of that is what happened in 2016, because it empowered people who thought that you can't change anything. The, you know, the, the, there's a certain group of people who are going to choose our candidate and we're stuck with it, so just live with it, who are now saying, no, we actually have some control over this, and they exercise some control in the primary. And I think even though they're being told, well, this is kind of a DFL state, they're seeing that there is a possibility they, they can make a huge difference. The other difference I'm seeing, I had so many people come up to me in 2014 that said, well, things seem to be going okay. I really like you, Jeff, but why would we change horses in midstream? I'll, I'll keep an eye on the race. Nobody's saying that today. Nobody's saying that today. They are saying, enough, we're going to change. Now, a few people want to change in a different way than we do, but most of the people want to change, and they're very willing to listen to how we're going to make that change. They're, Minnesotans are kind of fed up with the way government is working, or in many cases isn't working, and, and how they're being treated, and how much money is being taken out of their pockets. So that's kind of what I'm hearing. I would just have to echo the same thing, you know, having been here at the fair almost every single day, that's what people are telling us, is that they really have been paying attention, the last eight years haven't been working, and so they want to see a change. Keep, you start okay. Well, actually, I, this one is uh, directly for, for Donna. Donna, you know, Jeff's been out there campaigning. You've been out there campaigning just as hard, going around the state. Uh, talk a little bit about what this experience has been like for you. Lieutenant governor candidates tend to fly under the radar a little bit, but you've been out there working just as hard. So I'm curious, you know, what the experience has been like. And when you're out, not, not just here, but around the state, uh, what are some of the top issues that you hear uh, brought up? Well, I think in particular, people are really energized about turning Minnesota red this year. And they say, this is our year. So that's what I hear over and over, whether I'm at a county fair, in a parade, or um, just out meeting people. That's what they tell us. And I love to hear that, because I think this is the year. Um, I just think it's very exciting. It's a very fast-moving campaign. So um, people even asked, oh, after the primary, you're going to get a little bit of a break. And I don't <laughs> think we did. <laughs> it's just pedal to the metal, and that's what we want to do. So I'm, I'm ready to do it. We're boots on the ground, and we're ready to hit it and meet people. Yeah, and, and we didn't want a break after the primary, so thank God we didn't get one. I mean, we, we, could, we could both be sitting at home right now. So this, this is much better 
And uh, when you say Donna's been everywhere, holy cow, she has been everywhere. And, you know, she starts out in the northeast corner of the state and ends up in the southern. I mean, she's, I'm a little more centrally located at least, but she is everywhere, and I'm so thankful for that. And, uh, you know, I would agree. What I, what I hear, we hear a lot about different issues, but people... People are, are, are really frustrated with the attitude that they see in government right now, particularly some of our government agencies, the MPCA or the DNR or the Department of Human Services, right on down the list. And there is this culture in St. Paul that says, we have to help you all make better decisions about your own lives. And that's not the role of government. And, and people are finally waking up and saying, you know, we don't have to put up with that anymore. And we can force some change. And so we talk about this every day is, you know, we're going to wake up to change every morning, to change that culture in government, to actually serve people rather than control us and direct us and tell us how to live our lives. It, that has to change. We've done several panels over the course of the past week, and, and this, I don't want to say a theme has emerged, but something, something I, kind, of, kind of came up to the surface, and that was with the opportunity to, to change parties in so many of these seats, these are seats that, have been, that are being abused. And, and we talked about it yesterday during the panel where you have a, you know, an attorney general candidate like, like Doug Wardlow who can run on, I'll actually serve in that position and do the job and do it appropriately. So talk a little bit about that. Talk a little bit about, you know, I, I'm hesitant, hesitant, hesitant to say abuse of power, but talk about the way that, that you know, in terms of Governor Mark Dayton, how he's used that position, the culture yeah. of, of what the DFL has done to so many of these positions and the position you're running for. Well, there is an abuse of power at the, at the governor's level, and I see it in all of the agencies, because every one of the agencies, is, a, is the, the leadership is appointed by the governor, and they serve the governor. And so look at these agencies and what we've been seeing, the... the Marquee example is the child care fraud, 200 or 100 million dollars in one year that was stolen from taxpayers and people who need help to, for child care. It, it, it just defrauded and then you know sent in suitcases in many cases to Somalia. That that is that's not incompetence. That's abuse of power. That is corruption. There's no way you can argue that people didn't know about that. They knew about it, and they turned a blind eye because th this is the same Department of Human Services that is driving small in-home daycare providers out of business because they've got a plunger out in the bathroom or something like that, and they claim they don't know about tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars uh, being stolen from taxpayers. So, and that's not, that might be the most high-profile example, but we have the examples of elder abuse. You can look at Minlar which still isn't fixed and we're gonna spend you know millions more on that you can look at Minsure which eight years later is still a disaster and nobody seems to be doing anything about it and to me if you are a governor and you're not fixing these things or stopping these things or calling these things out that's a tremendous abuse of power and that has to end there's a complicity there absolutely there's, there there's is. a complicity there when, when you don't actively try to prevent and stop these things from going on. Carol, uh, we were talking with Pam Myra yesterday, the uh, uh, auditor candidate, and she's talking about $250,000 just going missing from an affordable uh, housing fund. Yep. It's, it's infuriating to think how much wealth has been sucked out of the pockets of Minnesotans, has been taken from family budgets, and gone to all of these things where you see fraud, abuse, mis, uh, mis, mishandling of money, and you get nothing in return. Right, and that's all money that is was at least intended to help people who supposedly needed help, and they're not getting it either. So we're taking it from the taxpayers, and we're not even helping people with it, which is that's about as bad as it gets. You had the opportunity to uh, debate your opponent here at the fair uh, the other day. I think it was on Friday. A couple days ago. Uh, had to talk about how that went. What did you? How did you think it went? What did you? Did you learn anything uh, in that in that process? I didn't learn anything new. We were a little outnumbered. It was at NPR, and so we what twenty to one? Would you Ooh. argue, Donna? Uh, but that's okay. I mean, we we knew that would be the case going in. Um, I, I, this was not new for me. We already knew this, but it became even more apparent is that Tim Walls, he's very good at politics. I mean, he is a great politician, and as I mentioned during the debate, he's the best politician I know at answering a question without actually answering the question and giving us happy talk for two minutes 
And then you sit back and say, oh, that sounded good, but I have no clue what the answer to the question was. So he's really good at that. We need to keep poking holes in it. And one thing that came up, because I mentioned this at our first debate, and I don't know if you all saw it, but there was an a actually very accurate story in the Star Tribune about the governor's race this morning that talked about all of the spending promises he's making to everyone under the sun, but he doesn't have an answer as to how much is this going to cost and who's going to pay for it. And I brought that up yesterday, and we're going to keep, keep bringing that up. If we're actually starting to compile all the promises he's made in, in questionnaires and debates, and uh, you know, starting with single payer health care, you know, essentially free child care for people, free college, um, right on down the list, we're probably talking about it, many billions of dollars a year. And I think Minnesotans are becoming wise to that. I, I really think they have become smarter than maybe we were 20 years ago, where we just kind of ignored all this, and if it made us feel good, fine. I think they're starting to ask the question, wait, if you're going to promise me all these things, who's going to pay for that? Because in the end, you can't tax rich people enough to pay for what he wants. We're all going to be paying for that, and, and we already are paying too much. We're going to be paying very very dearly for it. So that, that will be a theme that, you know, he's, he's Santa Claus, but it's not going to work in the end. For, uh, for both of you guys, how close do you, do you pay attention to the media coverage? You know, we, you know, we read these stories every single morning. And, I mean, it's, the conversations that we have on the air are one thing. The conversations we're having off the air are... You know, I mean, they're extensions of that because they're so blatantly biased. I mean, to the point where I, I, I don't even think the Star I mean, I wonder if the Star Tribune even realizes how blatant they're being in the coverage. I mean, you can just break it down. So how close do you guys pay attention to that, and, and how do you work through and deal with that? Well, I try to, you know, keep up on the news just to see what is being said. Um, I don't really focus it on... Um, that so much as I do what I'm hearing from the people, um, what I'm realizing through conversations with people who are living some of those um, uh, regulations or restrictions or the high taxes. So um, I do read them, but I really kind of take them with a grain of salt. Yeah, and I, I don't pay great attention to that just because we go crazy and there's not a heck of a lot you can do about it. It's terrible. I mean, it is just <laughs> terrible. Oh, yeah, it's bad. Yeah. It's Keith Ellison bad. Oh, yeah. It yeah, it's like, yeah, it's, yeah, it's okay, almost Keith Ellison that's a bad. High standard. Not quite. I mean, he's like the worst, but, but it's like right there. But that's why I just said, you know, there was a story in the Star Tribune today that was accurate and fair. Right. Because right. you just don't see it. Of course, it's, you know, it's hard to find. You can't even find it on the website anymore. It, 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 I had to search for it pretty hard. But yeah, it's really bad. We have been pushing back hard on that. And I, I, will, I will admit, four years ago, same thing was happening. But my attitude was nobody wants to hear you whine about the media, so let's just ignore sure. it. That was a mistake. And so we're, we're punching back hard because there, we shouldn't have to put up with that. And it's happening day after day after day, and people need to know that. So we'll continue to do that. Uh, along, the, along the same lines, just, just, just real quick, talk about perception versus reality. Perception in the media is they want to tie you to Trump. Yep. They think that that's the winning strategy on their end. Yep. So what's the reality when you're out talking to two people, when you're talking to voters? How much is Trump entering into the discussion uh, com you know, compared to what we see the media do in trying to tie any candidate to, to Trump? He comes up a lot, but it is, I would certainly say it's not the number one topic that I'm getting at the fair. It, you know, some people care and some people want to hear one thing and other people want to hear just the opposite. And so I have been very consistent. I know Donna has too, regardless of what I think you want to hear. I say I support the president. I think he's trying to take the country in the right direction. Doesn't mean I agree with him 100% of the time, like any president we've ever had. Our styles differ a bit, but uh, I think he's doing a good job and, and most people accept that answer. And the ones who don't, nothing you can do about it and they probably wouldn't have voted for us anyway. I don't know if you're seeing the same you no, know, I really get asked the same question, and I say the same thing. You know, I think he's heading in the right direction, and uh, we have different styles, but um, certainly I think, especially for our military, he's doing a great job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it helps when he is doing a great job, right? Mm -hmm. oh it makes it yeah, easy. Yeah, yes. it, it makes it easy when he tweets something and you go, uh-huh, you know, when you kind of go, yeah, but I have more money in the bank, and the economy is growing, is growing at a great rate when we were told it wasn't going to. I remember back in the Obama years, we weren't going to go above 2% GDP, and we're at 4.2 now. Well, yeah. 
magic, you know, so. Yeah, but he tweeted something that made me feel icky, John. Yeah, I, know. I, know. I, don't know I don't know how to feel about that. Um, the role of the lieutenant governor is loosely defined, to put it generously. Um, it's, it's rather undefined, right? I mean, so what do you anticipate your role? Uh, how, do you, how do you intend to approach the job? What are your priorities going into the uh, Johnson administration? Well, you know, that was one of the first things I wanted to see when we went to the Capitol and took our tour. I said, where's the lieutenant governor's office? And then we found out there really wasn't one. So I said, oh, that's interesting. Um, so everybody has approached it differently. But one of the things that we have talked about is having me be out and forward and meeting with people, going to forums, going to town halls, really kind of getting the ground truth from around the state and then making sure that Jeff's aware of it. Um, I also would help him as an advisor, so I would be on the advisory part of it. Um, and just really being available for people. I think it's great that I don't have an office in St. Paul because that's going to force me to get out and around the state. It means you don't have to go to St. Paul that often. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Well, and I, I, Donna is, I think she understates at least what I am hopeful will be her role because she's, and she has an amazing background. I get asked by the left all the time, um, you know, Donna is Native American, and that must have been so important in your choice. And I said, no, it's great, but that had nothing to do with it. I, I picked her because she's amazing. She's a former lieutenant colonel in the Marine Corps Reserve. She's a former guardian ad litem. She's a former business owner. She's a mom. She's an activist. Uh, she's never held office, which I actually think is a good thing because we want to change how government works. And, uh, you know, I, you'll have an office if you want an office. I, I hope you're in St. Paul. But, I, you know... I, I want her out there a lot, but she is going to be crucial to me when it comes to veterans issues because she's actually lived it when it comes to education issues and issues with children because that's what her background is in. So um, she, I think we complement each other well. She's going to be crucial. I think, it's, I, I, I think it's a fantastic pick. I think you deserve a lot of credit for that pick. Uh, Donna, one more uh, follow-up question sure. for you. Talk a little bit about you know, having not been a politician, having not held office. Mm -hmm. What was your reaction like when you kind of got the, because I imagine you got wind a little early, but that, that you were being considered. What was your reaction like when you were asked to join the ticket? Well, I was certainly humbled and honored. I just really, you know, had to kind of pinch myself and say, is this real? Um, but really, when it came to deciding about it, I did, you know, talk with my family because this is a big commitment. It keeps me away from my family quite a bit. And then I was also very prayerful about it to see if this was, you know, the right thing for me. And so I think it was both of those things. My family's very excited for me. My son is 13 years old, so he's actually kind of at that phase where he doesn't think I'm as cool anymore. So it's kind of nice having me out there. Um, and then my husband certainly is very supportive of it. So, and I think, you know, um, all those things came together and I was very honored because I uh, think Jeff is one of the hardest working public servants I've ever met and he's a man of honor and integrity. And I know that's something that's rare in politics and it shouldn't be. So with Jeff Johnson as our governor, we're going to have a man of integrity in office. Jeff, you're uh, not only running against Tim Walls, uh, you know, you, you, you're running against some very well-funded, very powerful groups in the state. Alliance for a Better Minnesota, Education Minnesota, various public sector unions are all coming after you, you know, full guns a-blazing. Yep. You don't necessarily have an equivalent sort of counter on the right side. We don't have an Education Minnesota. We don't have an Alliance for a Better Minnesota, uh, at least not to that scale. Uh, talk a little bit about the challenges and I'm sure you know frustrations that, that, that come along with having to run against such a multi-pronged opposition like that. So Alliance for a Better Minnesota, which is the lefty group that kind of kind of conglomerates all the lefty money and then spends it against Republicans. We actually got a little, we got about a three day reprieve after the primary because they'd already made all their commercials about Palenti and they had to go back to the drawing board and, and come up with some against me, but they did. And it's really, it's weak and it says I'll eliminate pre-existing condition coverage, which is just a blatant lie, but they put it up there anyway and just play it a lot. It, it'll, it's gonna be really nasty. Um, we're gonna get out spent from the outside, although not nearly as bad as four years ago. It was five, six to one four years ago. This time there is, um, there's a pretty engaged effort of conservatives who are going to be able to counter that pretty effectively, maybe not dollar for dollar, but darn close. So that'll make a big difference. I'll actually, will actually be able to outspend Tim Walls 
because we have spending limits. We're both stuck with spending limits, and he's already spent 2.1, 2.2 million dollars. We've spent about 400,000. So as long as we can raise the money, which we're doing, um, we're actually going to have a we're going to have an advantage there. And you know, make no mistake, we are overall we'll probably get outspent, but you know. You can look at a lot of races, including one from three weeks ago, where the spending is not the determinative factor. So that's, yeah. that's comforting. Talk a little bit about from primary till now and change in tone, change in campaign, and maybe in, in momentum um, now, that, you know, now that we're past that. Yep. So the momentum is unbelievable. I, we, we remark on this every single day. We're out here and, you know, Donna might be out here for five or six or eight hours, and I'm out here for five or six or eight hours, and we don't get to leave the booth. I mean, we, we have to find somebody to, to stop people so we can go to the bathroom or get something to eat, because there is oftentimes a line of four, five, six people waiting to either talk to us or take a picture, and that is, that is just so different from anything I've ever felt before. We felt it in the primary for a month, maybe five weeks, uh, before the actual primary date where there was just this groundswell of enthusiasm and engagement, especially from people who aren't typical Republican activists, many of whom I'm seeing out here. You know, this is not all just the, the people we see every year showing up at the state convention. And uh, that is, I mean, that's how we're going to win that grassroots network. It's, it's what won us the primary. It wasn't us. It was a couple hundred thousand people out there who were talking to all of their friends and we're hearing that every day. Well, I'm, I'm talking to everybody I know. We'll send you 50 bucks because that's all we can send you. But we are talking to everybody that we know. We'll put up a yard sign and we'll go door knocking for you. And that energy, that, that is ju it just continues to grow every day. If we can keep that going and raise some money, which is not going to be a problem, uh, I, think we're in, I think we're in a really good spot. Well, I'm a Marine. So I come from a long history of Marines who have been outnumbered, outspent, outcornered, and they've managed to wiggle their way out and win the battle. So I bring that um, spirit with me. Speaking of the primary, I just want to take a moment to, to give you some credit because I don't think you've, got, you, you've gotten early enough credit. There were a number of high-profile Republicans that were running for governor when Tim Pawlenty decided to enter the race. And one by one, they just dropped out, dropped out, dropped out. You stuck to it. You stuck to your message. Uh, you, 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 you ran a, a fantastic campaign. And uh, it's got to be very gratifying to have that hard work and that dedication pay off with the primary win yeah. when I'm sure... You don't, have to, you don't have to answer, but I'm sure you were under a fair amount of pressure, you know, to just sort of just get out of the way. Yeah, Tim yeah. Pawlenty's back. He's decided he wants to be governor again. Just just get out of the way, and, and, and this will all be a lot easier. Yes, there was some of that. Yeah. Um, and it is, it's, it's particular. I've won some races, and I've lost some races, but it, this, it's particularly sweet when you win, when everybody who knows anything says that you had no chance and probably should just get out of the race. And... So I get a call from President Trump the day after the election. He called me on my cell phone, and his first words were, um, hey, buddy, nice job. Isn't it fun to win when nobody thinks you can? <laughs> so they are watching in the, in the White House, and, and I believe that President Trump will be back. I bet you Vice President Pence will be back. He knows he can win Minnesota in 2020, and he knows if he wants to do that, he's got to be here. So that excites me a lot. Well, as we play on the show often, the best part of waking up is, is that Hillary lost to Trump. So, <laughs> On the issues, is there one or two that are sticking out the most when, when people talk to you? And, and I guess along with that two part, um, is there, and are, are there any surprises in, in, with, with that? Are you like, oh, I'm surprised this is being talked about a lot. So talk about the issues that people are bringing up to you and whether or not you expected that or it's yep. not expected that. So I'm curious to hear if Donna has any surprises. I don't have any big surprises. Um, I would say um, the issue of marijuana legalization surprises me a little bit at the number of people who ask about that. But, uh, but the fact that it's coming up doesn't surprise me. <laughs> so healthcare. I mean, that is probably the issue that I hear most out here about because people are scared to death about their health care. And we lose, as Republicans, on that issue election after election after election because they, they promised the world. I don't think we lose this time because of where, how far Tim Walls wants to go 
You can't sell single-payer health care to anybody who's paying any attention because we all lose our health insurance. And if people understand that, everybody, I think everybody's thought is, as long as I can keep mine, I'll, I'll pay more to help other people. But if you're going to take mine away and, put, and force me to one government system, which is what single-payer health care is, we need to make people understand that. Single-payer health care means everybody at this fair loses their insurance and we're all part of you know, the VA, essentially. And it doesn't work. And it also, it, it, I can guarantee you, it's going to drive uh, rural clinics and hospitals out of business because the only way you can do it, other than increasing taxes dramatically, which will happen, is the reimbursement rates are just cut rate and they won't be able to afford to survive. So that's a big issue and I think we win on this issue. And then immigration comes up a lot. Tim Walls has taken an extreme position for the DFL party by saying we should be, he thinks we should be a sanctuary state. It, and once again, there's a lot of people who don't know what that means. We have to explain that to them. It means that Minnesota becomes the safe haven for illegal immigrants in the country, and we will essentially stop the federal government from doing anything about that. That's not who we need to be. And then the last one is taxes. We're one of the highest tax states in the country, and Tim Walls believes it needs to be higher. Yeah, I would say I don't have any surprises. Um, pretty much everybody talks about the taxes. Yeah, everybody talks about the health care. Um, people talk about their small businesses, how they're not able to um, do what they want to do because of the restrictive regulations. So on and on with that. Mm -hmm. And one more point on the, the sanctuary state issue. It's not just so much that they be, we become a safe haven. They also get access to all of our entitlement benefits, all of our social benefits. Simply cannot afford that. There is no way any state can sustain being you know, open and welcoming. We're not going to enforce immigration laws. Everybody come here. And you also get on our health care system. You get on our welfare system. Yep. It's impossible. Yep. Uh, you mentioned marijuana legalization. Tim Walls, there was a story in uh, one of the outlets a couple days ago that Tim Walls has now publicly you know, come out in favor of decriminalization, of uh, supporting recreational marijuana use. Um, my opinion is, and this is just my opinion, I only speak for myself, my opinion is that this is where the electorate is going in that direction. Yep. You're seeing it in state by state. Yep. We've had you on the show a number of times, and you've in the past said you know you are opposed to, uh, to this. Has your stance changed, evolved in, in any way whatsoever, and do you anticipate this being a, a major issue in this election? So my position hasn't changed, and, and Tim Wallace's position is not decriminalization, it's legalization, which is very different, um, because I, I actually lean towards decriminalization from the standpoint of, I don't think people should go to jail if they choose to smoke pot and aren't hurting anybody else. I don't, I don't, I don't think that's the right response to it. But I, don't, I also don't think we should legalize it, and, and I think that sends a really bad message to kids. And I look at what's happening, I, I don't just kind of listen to the propaganda, I actually look at what's happening in places like Colorado, and there are some really significant consequences to this, particularly in the workplace. Um, so I, I, I am not there. I don't see myself getting there. I also, rec and I, I do support medical marijuana, by the way, and I always have. Um, but I recognize that culture is probably passing me by on this one, and it has on other things in the past. And I tell people that. I said, listen, it, you know, whether it's five years from now or 15 years from now, I suspect that that's where we will be as a state. Uh, but I, I am not going to be part of, of blessing that or pushing it as governor. I, I think the consequences are too high. Perception is, at least in my opinion, that on the, on the immigration issue and on, on health care, because we've been talking about it so much for the course of the past four or five years, that the voters are smarter about both those issues than they were before. Are you, are you sensing that as well? Because it, it seems like, and I could be you know way off the mark here, but it seems like a Tim Walls approach to health care just is not going to, as you mentioned, it's not going to fly with the majority of people. It may have back when Obama was pushing Obamacare, but people, are, people know better now. So I'm curious if you feel that people are better educated on both immigration and health care than, than, than prior runs, prior campaigns. Yeah, I, I, they might be better educated, but I, I guess what I would say more importantly is they're, they're willing to ask more questions and think more deeply about it and do their research because... 
when people come up and talk to me about, obviously healthcare is so complex, and none of us has the easy answer, because there isn't one. Um, but when I talk to people about it, and I share some of the stats that I know of, or, or the issue about single payer and what that does with reimbursement rates and how that will affect rural clinics and hospitals and doctors, a lot of people say, well, I, I guess I never thought about that, or I didn't realize that. I'm going to look at that more closely. And that, I, I, again, I think Trump has, has convinced people that they don't just have to listen to talking points anymore. They actually are empowered now to do their research, ask tougher questions, not allow you to get away with the talking points and say, no, wait a second, you didn't answer my question. This is what I want to know. So I hear that on health care. Uh, immigration, no question. People understand what's, I mean, it's much more personal to them than it was four years ago and before that. And, and I think it becomes more personal every day because of some of the stories that we're seeing. And uh, I've talked to very few people in Minnesota who think that being a sanctuary state makes any sense at all. Refugee resettlement has been an issue that, that I feel like you've, you've gotten a, a good amount of traction with. Yep. Talk a little bit about, you know, uh, the process of, I, I think people need education on that issue, first of all. I don't think people really understand. They hear the phrase refugee resettlement, but they don't really know what that means and they don't really know what Minnesota's background has been right. when it comes to that. So talk a little bit about that issue and, and, and how you differentiate yourself uh, from Tim Walls there. So uh, there's a huge misunderstanding about refugee resettlement. We've had a few people come up to the booth, angry people, and say, why do you hate refugees or why do you hate immigrants so much? And, you know, if you're a Christian, that, that's that's not how we are. And my response is to explain to them exactly as you said, Minnesota, because that's not true, Minnesota has been the most generous state in America accepting refugees, by far. It's not even marginally close. We have, I believe, 13% of the refugee population, population and 2% of the country's population. So we've been extremely generous, and there are some wonderful success stories to tell about refugees who have come here in the past but it's not working right now. And my belief is if it's not working right now, then rather than continue to do, to do the same thing, let's figure out why it's not working and try to fix that. And so we have communities in Minnesota, St. Cloud and Winona and Rochester and Fargo-Moorhead and many others where there are citizens who are really concerned about the cost of this and how this is changing their communities because they've seen a large influx of refugees, especially Somali refugees. And the, the response they get is not, okay, let's look at that or here's the cost. The response they get is, we can't talk about that because you're a racist. Or, or as the governor, as our current governor would tell them, leave the state if you disagree with it. He actually said that to these people. And that's not the answer government is supposed to give. It is, okay, let's discuss it. Let's find out what the costs are because they are tremendous. And then let's figure out if this is the right thing. On top of that, we haven't had as many success stories lately. And when you look at the, the most recent refugees from the past five or 10 years, many of them are not achieving the American dream which is what we want for them. The, the unemployment rate in the Somali population is sky high. I, I think the last number I saw was 41% of Somali men are employed in Minnesota. I mean, that's crazy when everybody's looking for workers right now. So something's not right. Let's figure that out. Let's stop and figure that out. And then let's take a look at it again down the road. How much is, is uh, Mark Dayton playing into this? And I, I mean, I know for me, I can only speak for me. I mean, he's already out of my, yeah. I've already kind of, you know, he's awful. I mean, he, Keith Ellison's here. He's like here. But so, but I'm, but I'm curious if it's, if it's, if there's any sort of residual effect, if, if his name is being talked about at all, or if it's all just, I mean, if I were, a, if I were a DFLer, I'd be like ignoring right. him. So I'm just, I'm curious what the, what the campaign's been like in terms of Dayton. Yeah, well, we both hear it all the time. I, I mean, over and over and over again is we can't handle, you know, another term. And a lot of people don't even know if he's running or not. But I bring him up a lot because my argument is Tim Walls is Mark Dayton's third term about six steps to the left which is hard to believe, but he, I mean, Tim Wallace has taken such far lefty positions to get through this primary. People are, are tired of the Dayton administration, and they need to understand that Tim Wallace is not a break from that. He is a continuation of that, just more liberal. And that's, a, that's an important part of our message. Yeah. 
The only thing I would like to add is I've actually had families come up to our booth here that are from Wisconsin who said, you know, Governor Dayton said, if we don't like the taxes, go ahead and move. And we did. <laughs> and they packed up from Stillwater and moved to Hudson, or they packed up from, you know, and I said, that's not the kind of state that we want. Plus, this is my home. I don't want to leave here. I want to live here. I want to live here. I want to be able to afford to live yeah. here, yes. right? Right. And exactly. Tim Walls gets elected with all of the programs that he's promising. Yeah. We're not going to be able to afford to live here anymore. I mean, I, I don't think he has any sort of contingency plan to pay for these things when suddenly we start seeing a mass exodus of wealth, when we see an exodus of businesses, we see an exodus of all the people that he needs to be able to support to pay for all these plans. Uh, he, and he yeah, doesn't. Rocks and cows. He, rocks and cows are going to pay for it all. <laughs> and he doesn't have a contingency plan, but he doesn't even have a, pl a, a, a preliminary plan because he's making these promises knowing that it will be impossible to keep them. Um, he'll raise taxes as high as he can, but it'll still only cover a quarter of what he's promising, I think. It's, it's frustrating because Walls represents to me one of the worst type of politicians who really doesn't seem to have much of a core. Just whatever he's running for, he's going to say what he needs to say. And that is not, you can't exemplify that any better when you look at his track record with the NRA. Okay. Yeah. When he's running in a you know, fairly conservative district that values the Second Amendment, that values their hunting cultures, he gets A's from the NRA. All of a sudden he wants to run for governor. He needs those metro votes. Now he's bragging about getting an F. Well, and he didn't just get A's. He did TV commercials about the A's three years ago or two years ago it would be and you know I, I, I poke hard on that during every one of our joint appearances and his response after talking for two minutes and not saying anything is well the NRA has changed dramatically since when you and I were kids Jeff and I said well maybe maybe not but they haven't changed dramatically since two years ago when you celebrated them on TV and now you're wearing your F as in fail, as a badge of honor. And he doesn't really have an answer for that. One of the issues that I feel has been a little bit under the radar is, uh, is infrastructure, is roads and bridges, is traffic. Traffic congestion, I think most people would agree, has gotten demonstrably worse. Especially at the fair. <laughs> Especially <laughs> trying to get here. <laughs> um, you know, I moved here, what, eight, eight and a half years ago, and I remember telling people when I came here, you know, for a city and metro area this size, I was impressed at the traffic flow. I said, this, it's really not that bad, but it has gotten worse and worse yep. and worse and worse and worse. Why do you think that is, and, and what, is your, what are your thoughts on how you can help remedy that? Well, the biggest reason is we can't focus on what people actually want to use for transportation. We, we made a decision six or eight years ago um, and the Met Council's part of it, some within MnDOT are part of it, and certainly the current administration is all about this, that said instead of trying to help people get to where they want in the ways that they want to, we are going to try to change their behavior. And so we're going to spend an inordinate amount of, of energy and time and money on things like light rail and commuter rail, and now we're talking about folks, hundreds of millions of dollars to rebuild the trolley system no. in no. Minneapolis no. and St. Paul. No. no, it's moving forward. No. And, <laughs> no. Sorry, you're losing right no, now. I, no, I <laughs> know. It, and I mean, we tore that thing out, what, 70, 80 years ago because it didn't make sense anymore. But now it's cool again, and Portland has it. So no, we're, it's not that, cool. That is all money that <laughs> could Portland. that could be spent to relieve congestion with respect to, to roads and bridges and highways. And I, I believe in transit. We need transit in our population centers, but buses are so much more cost effective and efficient. You can change the route, it, it just, it makes so much more sense. But you know, buses are kind of yesterday and light rail and commuter rail is today. Commuter rail, okay, I just gotta bring this one up. North Star commuter line. Do you know what percentage of each ticket is paid for by taxpayers? 84%. 16, one six percent is paid by the rider, 84 percent is paid by the taxpayer, and they want to extend it further, but it's not working. And so if, if we could be spending at least some of this money or more of this money on our infrastructure, we would all be in a better place, I believe. Keeping a, a running tally of things that are the worst. So it's, it's Keith Ellison, and then, and then current Governor Mark Dayton, and then, and then trolleys. I've got, a, I've got a history. We don't have to get into it now. Um, so I, we asked this yesterday, and on a personal note, let's flash forward. Um, you guys win the election. Yay, celebrate. Um, when you wake up in the morning, what's, what's, what's one aspect of the job that you look most forward to for, for both of you guys? You want to start? Have, you, have you thought much about it yet? Am I putting you on the spot? But what you know, you think about the job and you go, man, that's when I go to work every day. That's what I look forward to. 
Well, I am looking forward to Jeff Johnson being our governor because of his... Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Yay, I'm on the team. Um, because he's a leader. And that is something that we haven't had for so long that um, we just need that. And I'm going to look forward to doing that. And really, I'm looking forward to carrying his vision of um, Minnesota, how Minnesota is going to work for everybody throughout the state. So that is what I'm looking forward to. I'm probably most looking forward to being able to actually help Minnesotans solve some of the problems that are bothering them so much and bothering me, things that I've been complaining about for eight years, that we are actually going to be in a position to solve them or at least start solving them. And I think, I'm not sure at the federal level if that's possible anymore, to be perfectly honest, but it still is at the state level, especially in Minnesota. It's just not as bad here, and we've certainly drifted too far to the left, and government has become too big and powerful and arrogant. But we can reverse those trends still, I think, at this level. And so, that, I mean, that's what excites me. It sounds kind of wonky, but it's what excites me the most is you actually can change things at this level, and that's what we're going to do. Undo a lot of what Dayton has done. Yeah. There's going to be a lot, a lot of undoing. I look um, forward to you doing that. <laughs> one, of the big, one of the big hurdles in that process, though, is going to be the Met Council. Yep. So what is your plan on tackling the problem that the Met Council has grown into? It has become basically an unaccountable branch of yep. government that is not filled with elected representation, yet it has taxation authority. So what is your what is your plan and how big a priority is that for uh, the Johnson administration? We will dismantle them. That'll be one of the early things that we do. And folks, that's not to say that we don't need some sort of regional authority. We do. We need a regional authority to accept federal transportation dollars. I actually think the Met Council does a pretty good job with wastewater management, and I think that makes sense to do on a regional basis. But that's also secondary. Exactly. That's what they were started for. And now that's, that's kind of an afterthought almost, and it is about trying to control the growth in cities with respect to elected officials, and it's about equity. They, they made equity one of their top writers. Well, important issue, but not if you're the Met Council. It has nothing to do with why you're there. And so I don't think we can fix the Met Council. I think we need to end the Met Council, and then let's create a body that, number one, doesn't have taxing authority, number two, is very constrained in what their powers are, and let them do some of those basic regional things that make sense still. We are uh, about out of time uh, for this uh, conversation. Uh, give you guys both a couple minutes here to give some closing statements, uh, you know, any calls to action, like donate, 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 that you might want the audience to, uh, to hear. Well, Thank you all for attending, and for any of our veterans that are here in the audience, thank you for your service. Our Vietnam vets, welcome home. Our families of our veterans and our service members and our military, thank you also. You're all part of the process. Um, I just want to say this has really been an honor to be here. Um, I would be honored to serve as your Lieutenant Governor of the great state of Minnesota, and I would wake up every day to work for you. I really look forward to doing that. And um, I don't know if there's anything else I really need to add. I thank you all for coming. Isn't she awesome? So I'll just thank you guys, and, and thank you for everything you've already done for us and what I know you're going to continue to do. We won the primary. I, I've said this before, not because of us, but because we had that network out there of people just working their tails off and talking to everybody. And if there is an outside money advantage for the other side, as there might be, we've got the grassroots advantage. So thank you so much for that. Please keep that up. Please keep talking to people. Uh, donations are quite welcome. You can go online and do that. And uh, that's going well. But, you know, we're going to rely upon tons of $1,500 donations rather than all the $8,000 donations. I, I will just say, don't let anybody get away with claiming that Tim Walls is a moderate from southern Minnesota. If somebody says that, you challenge them and you challenge them hard. Because after this primary, he is on the far left of the DFL party. 
He wants to be a sanctuary state. He thinks taxes are too low in Minnesota. He doesn't believe there should be a work requirement for people able to work who want welfare benefits. He wants to be a single-payer health care state and, and essentially go to a completely government-run system. He got an F from the NRA and is proud of that. He bragged at their convention that he was so pro-choice that Nancy Pelosi had to tell him to tone it down a little bit. So he is, he is on the far fringe end, and he's proud of that. And now he's going to try to ignore all that, and the media is going to play right along with it. Don't let him get away with that. He's one of the most liberal governor candidates that Democrats have in the entire country right now, and we need Minnesotans to understand that. We're going to change things in the opposite way. We are going to empower people over government and over institutions. And as we travel the state, I mean, we've combined for well over 50,000 miles over the past year, and we've talked to tens of thousands of Minnesotans, and it is so satisfying for us to be able to look people in the eye and say that we are looking forward to, to leading a government where we are lifting up not the bureaucrats, not the politically well-connected, but the everyday heroes in this state, the ones who get up every morning at 5.30 and struggle to make the small business work or drive the semi-truck or wait the tables. And it is or those talk people or talk. You guys are you know, everyday just, heroes. Uh, <laughs> and we, with, really, we give. Those, those are the people <laughs> that we really will listen to when we have tough decisions to make. Those are the people we're going to give the government back to in the state of Minnesota. We're going to turn Minnesota red, and we just want to thank you for all your help on that. Yeah, and big, thank you guys, too. Big round of applause. Your next governor, Jeff Johnson, your next lieutenant governor, Donna Bergstrom. We simply cannot afford Tim Walls. That's just the bottom line. We cannot afford Tim Walls and his plans. I want to thank you guys out for coming out, and uh, give a round of applause for all the people working the, uh, the booth here, all the volunteers. They're great. My name's Drew. This is John Justice. Got to get the obligatory plug out of the way. Justice and Drew, we're on the air Monday through Friday, 6 to 9, Twin Cities News Talk, AM 1130. Hope you'll uh, check the show out, and thank you guys. Have a wonderful time at the fair. Thank you.